protecting purposes of their loyalist brethren, a band of renegade guardsmen have forsaken the Imperium of Man. But for the warriors of the Adeptus Astartes, this heresy cannot stand. Will this elite Phobos strike team cleanse the sector of traitor's filth, or can the bones of chaos guide their adversaries to victory? Welcome to Mountainside Tabletop! Hey everyone, thanks for hanging out with us for another Kill Team Battle Report. Today, I'm going to be playing my half of the Morok box, the Phobos Strike Team. My team will be led by an Infiltrator Sergeant and consist of an Incursor Marksman and the Saboteur, Medic, Comms, and Veteran Infiltrators. For the custom profile on my Veteran's Bolter, I'm giving him Lethal 5 Ups and Balanced. Uh, Ace said that was the best option on Glass Half Dead's podcast, <laughs> and who am I to disagree? True. I'm pretty new to playing elite teams like this, but I love all the little tricks and abilities these units have, and if I can find the right balance of dealing damage while staying safe, I think I've got a pretty good chance. As for equipment, I'm going to give my commsmen and marksmen smoke grenades and put a good old crack grenade on my vet. Oh Vic, aren't space marines terrible at this game? <laughs> also, Brad here, sup y'all. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, Vic's scariest unit here is definitely the marksman. He's got the same standard 12 wound and 3 up save as the rest of the team, so he's not easy to kill by any means. With team-wide access to the Guerrilla Warfare ability, the Phobos can be even more KG. They have the option to swap their order during their activation at the cost of 1 AP. This means that they can shoot at me and then still end their activations with a conceal order. All of this is not even what makes the Marksman so scary though. What truly gives me nightmares is his Stalker Marksman Bolt Carbine. It's got four shots that hit on twos, crit on fives, and it has AP1, all with decent damage. This guy can one-shot almost any operative I have, and with Bolter Discipline, he also has the chance to shoot twice in the same turning point. Last but not least, the Track Target ability lets the Marksman interrupt one of my activations, potentially allowing Vic to get a kill on a key model before they have a chance to shoot or steal a point. Killing this marksman has got to be my number one priority. Another gnarly operative is the saboteur. This guy's shooting is worse than the marksman's, but he's got some serious area denial. His remote explosives take some effort to set up, but once everything is in place, it will almost surely one-shot anything within range when it goes off. If Vic manages to plop it down on a key choke point or objective, and then get his saboteur to safety, I'm in trouble. The leader for the Phobos in this game will be the Infiltrator Sergeant. He's got the standard extra wound and slightly better shooting that most leaders have, along with the strategize ability that generates extra CP. This kind of encourages Vic to keep the Sergeant safe and out of harm's way in order to keep collecting more and more CP, which also in turn will hurt my chances of scoring with Headhunter. The Blooded are locked to seek and destroy for TAC Ops, and since so many of the other options are terrible for me, I often find myself forced into taking it even when I know it's undesirable. Spoiler alert, I have had to pick it up for this game and uh, I'm not feeling good about scoring it. Ah well. Let's take a look at what my team has going for it. What's up y'all, again, Brad's still here, and I'm happy to say that I am finally not playing an F tier team! Vic and I have been playing tons of games so far with our new Morok teams, and I have very much been enjoying everything the Blooded have to offer, even with all of the bookkeeping involved. Today, I will be bringing the Chieftain, Corpsman, Enforcer, Ogren, Flenser, Plasma, and Grenade- <laughs> Plasma and Grenade Launcher Gunners, Sharpshooter, Thug, Trench Sweeper, Butcher, and Brimstone Grenadier Operatives. This is my full roster because uh, this is all I built. I only have one box worth of guys so far. I'm not rich. Notably, I've left out the commsman and while I totally understand that he might be a better pick for a hyper competitive list, I've left him off of mine due to the simple fact that I thought he was the least cool model. 
Maybe one day I'll pick up a second box and add him to my roster. Who knows? Oh yeah, and as soon as I pick my corpseman, I get to give someone else on my kill team a regular dose. So I'm gonna give my butcher relentless on his melee weapons. Seems pretty good. The main gimmick of this team is the blooded token system. Long story short, there are a few ways to earn them, and I can hand them out to my operatives during the strategy phase. A dude with a blooded token can auto-retain one normal hit when they shoot or fight. Pretty good. If I have four or more out on the field at once, I can upgrade one guy with a blooded token to auto-retain a crit instead of a hit. Blooded tokens also interact with a few other elements of the team, but we'll just talk about those as they come up. For equipment, I've given my Butcher a Sinister Trophy, which forces enemies engaged with him to roll one less die when fighting. That's actually crazy good. I've also given my Grenadier, Butcher, and Thug armor plates, which lets them re-roll save rolls of one, and my Chieftain has Wicked Blades, upgrading the normal damage of his melee weapon by one. My Grenadier also gets a crack and a frag grenade for free. I would definitely have gone for full crack spam here if I could have, but unfortunately that ship has sailed and we are now living in a post-crack nerf society. Great change though, even if it does hurt me here. My biggest long range fear is Brad's plasma gunner. It is so scary to have such a reliable one shot threat on a 12 unit team. You can ignore the standard weapon profile, I know Brad well enough to say that he'll definitely be supercharging it on every single shot. AP2 is a total nightmare, so I'm really going to have to tread carefully while he's hanging around. If this unit gets put under the gaze of the gods, I might as well just resign on the spot. Easy. <laughs> on the melee side, the Butcher terrifies me. With Blood Offering, it has the ability to generate a ton of blooded tokens, and every time it kills one of my units, it heals. Also, since it's carrying the Sinister Trophy, my pretty average melee downgrades all the way to pathetic. I really need to try to injure the Butcher before he even thinks about charging, so I can cut that charge range down by a crucial two inches. Obviously, I have to take the threat of the Ogren very seriously. Even though it's unable to deal with mission objectives, it can really screw up my team in a hurry. All Brad needs to do is position it in a threatening place, and I'm going to have to sink at least two activations into neutralizing it or running away. You're reading that right, it has 16 wounds. I'm not good enough at dice math to trust this statistic, but I read somewhere that the average bolter damage on a unit with 5 up saves is 6 wounds. That means I'll have to rely on this thing taking 3 full activations to bring down. That's half of my whole turn. For this battle, we're going to be playing the Master the Terminals mission. Essentially, each objective is unavailable to be activated during the turning point corresponding to its number, but otherwise, operatives can activate them once per turning point for one victory point. Since I'm the attacker, I get to choose the turning point for the first objective. I select the one closest to Brad's deployment zone to be unavailable for the first turn. Brad then returns the favor for number two, and I lock in objective number four as the harder one for me to control. The kill zone includes everything that came in the Morok box, warts and all. Basically everything here is heavy, with a few special rules that will come up later. When we made the attacker defender roll off, I won and I chose to deploy my team on the side with this big square building. Why? Well, we played a lot of test games and Victor has for whatever reason decided that if I get the side of the board with this piece of terrain, I auto win. Now, I'm not sure I necessarily agree, but I'm playing mental warfare here and I'm thinking if I can tilt Victor before the game even begins, that's a good thing to do. So whether or not I even think this side is better did not come into my calculation at all. I just wanted to tilt Victor. <laughs> I think looking at the board we can all agree that this is a resignable position for me. So I'm going to take this opportunity to resign, say good game, and move on. All with right, my life. peace, y'all. <laughs> we place our barricades and set up our operatives. We're both basically just trying to hide as many guys as we can behind heavy cover. However, I do place my trench sweeper in a position where I can give him a free dash in the scouting phase and hopefully grab objective number three before Victor has a chance. I also selected the free dash in the scouting phase and moved my veteran up the board. I then played the tactical ploy Elite Reconnaissance, which gives me access to another scouting option. I selected the one that will allow me to change an order during the first turning point. Well, we tied in the scouting phase, but as the attacker, Vic takes initiative, and that takes us right into turning point number one. 
In the strategy phase, I play Omni Scramble on Brad's Trench Sweeper, which means he's not going to be able to move up to that juicy objective for at least five activations. Brad then put a blooded token on his grenade launcher, and I played Vanguard, bringing myself down to only one command point left. In the target reveal step, I reveal Triangulate, and Brad passes. First activation! I noticed that because of the stockade rule on these walls, Obscurement doesn't count when I'm on a vantage point, so I pop up onto here with my Helix Adept and take a shot at Brad's now exposed Enforcer. Oh man, forgot about that. All right, here comes the roll. Looking for fours with lethal fives. Not bad for a first roll. One crit and two hits go through. Oof. Well, this guy saves on fours, but I only save one. Seven wounds go through. One HP, gang. <laughs> <laughs> All right, most of this turning point for me is just going to be repositioning. So I'm just going to move my thug up to get on objective one. All right, I'm gonna move and dash my saboteur up to the wall. Not really sure what the plan is here, but I just wanted to keep him close to this big tower by objective four, because I had a feeling I'm gonna have to rig that with an explosive at some point. Next, I move my butcher up right next to the thug. All right, my sergeant moves down into the corner, gets one CP with strategize, bringing me up to two, and does the triangulate action on the long edge of the board. I just need to do this with one more kill zone edge, and I'll score one VP for the triangulate tack up. All right, now my medic is going to inject my Ogren, giving him relentless on his melee weapons. Then he'll move up to objective one as well. Next, my veteran moves and dashes to the kill zone edge, hides behind this wall and performs triangulate. That's one VP scored. Now my grenadier moves up behind this satellite dish, or the Auspex shrine, whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my marksman moves up, taps objective two for another VP, and then uses the track target ability, daring Brad to come get this objective. All right, my chieftain moves up. Not much here, my commsman just throws a smoke to cover off my marksman in case he goes engaged and then tucks in behind the corner. Well, finally, now I can move my trench sweeper up. I'm surprised that Victor hasn't targeted him yet, but I know that track target is a risk here. I do save on fours and I'm feeling like I don't wanna let my dreams be dreams, so I go for it. Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow, so just do it! Obviously, this is why I played track target, so my marksman takes a shot. It's an overwatch attack, so I need threes instead of twos, and I get one crit and two hits, not bad. I roll AP1, so I'm only rolling two dice, but saving on fours, and... Bruh. Total whiff. The trench sweeper's dead. As the trench sweeper falls, from across the battlefield, the chieftain screams, Our cause grows stronger with each drop of blood spilt by your hand. Well, our cause here at Mountainside Tabletop grows stronger with each new like and subscribe that we get, so, you know, hit the button, leave a comment, hit the bell, you know what to do. Well played, Vic, well played. Calculated risk and I fail. Vic's just on overwatch, so as long as I'm careful, I can just safely reposition my remaining units and uh, that finishes off the turning point. Obviously, like most first turning points, that was just spent positioning more strategically up the board. I was lucky to get that first shot off against the Enforcer, and then get that really key kill near Objective 3 with Track Target. Yeah, it's obviously still anybody's game, but I'm not feeling great. I really would have liked to uh, snag that extra point and kept that extra unit alive, but dice or dice, anything can happen. And you do have that terrain piece in your deployment zone, so my chances of winning are around 0%. Yeah, I'd say like 0. 0.000. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty close. All right, top of turning point two, and we both gain a command point and roll off for initiative, which thankfully I win. For strategic ploys, first, I choose Bolter Discipline. Then I pass. Then I'm going to use Vanguard. <laughs> then I pass. This is extremely frustrating because Brad just wants to know who I'm going to scramble before he decides on whom to put a blooded token. I know that everything Vic wants to do in this strategic phase is way more important than anything I can do, so I'm playing chicken hoping that he doesn't just pass as well and screw me out of using my blooded token, because even if he does, it's not that bad. It's worse for him. 
So I decide that I'd rather just deal with the Ogren while I can, and I Omni Scramble him so I can take up to five activations to worry about him. Finally, I do use my Blooded Token on the Grenadier, and I also spend a CP to put Glory Kill on the Saboteur. In the target reveal stage, I reveal Vantage, and Brad again doesn't reveal any TAC Ops. So that was a pretty great setup by Brad. There's threats everywhere, and I have to play defensively. I only have six units. If I lose one now, it's double resignable. I switch my Marksman's order to Concealed. I move him up to the Saboteur and drop a smoke between the two of them, making them both invisible. Then, I pop Track Target again, hoping that I can stop anyone from going towards Objective 4. Now normally I would just keep my sniper in cover no matter what because he's really meant for just sitting in cover but I think he's just a body right now and I really need to get on objective number 3 and score some points so I do that. I move up to objective 3 and tap it for a point. Alright big misplay incoming. I'm not sure what happened here because the whole purpose of using Bolter Discipline was to take two Bolter shots with my veteran at the Ogren, but my attention slipped and for some reason I attacked him with my crack grenade first. Brad gave me the option to retcon it, but the dice later the dice played, so I had to double down, use a command reroll. Luckily, a crit and two hits go through, the Ogren had a terrible save and is down to only 3 HP. Don't really have much to do now that I can't do another bolter attack, so I run away and use guerrilla tactics to change my order back to conceal. Honestly, that's still pretty bad because 3 HP is not good. <laughs> <laughs> Worse than 4 HP, yeah, some might totally. say. Okay, so next up I move my flenzer, uh, moves and dashes up behind this tower. Yeah, that's it. All right, now my saboteur dashes and plants the mine next to objective four. I move away, hoping to deter Brad from wanting to tap this point for as long as I can. Okay, well my chieftain moves up and hides behind the satellite as well. I'm starting to get pretty worried here because a state of attrition is not a good place to be in when you're down by five units just to begin the game. So I take my chance to shoot the Ogren before he activates. Not only do I need to get the Ogren off the board, but I need to limit Brad's ability to just do throwaway activations. With the explosives planted, I need Brad to need to go to the objective, because otherwise he can just wait me out until I'm in Overwatch and can't do anything about it. My Helix Adept pops onto the vantage point, shoots him and moves back down. I'm looking for threes here with lethal five. And the Ogren drops. Next, I activate my Corpsman, go and heal the Enforcer, I roll above average, and uh, he's back up to 6 wounds. Crucially, no longer injured. Alright, my second last chance to blow up that explosive, and so I wait for now. I wish I could do more, but my sergeant needs to be safe here. There's nothing to be gained from just trading units with Brad. I pop up, shoot the sniper to clear out that side of the map. Hitting on 2s with lethal 5, and the sniper's dead. Dash back down into hiding. Next, I tap objective number one with my thug and then move up in front of the big building. All right, well, I kind of fear it's now or never. If I don't get initiative, my saboteur could die before ever having a chance to detonate this explosive. So using my commsman's comms array ability, I trigger the saboteur to blow up the explosives, targeting only the flenzer. All right, so four dice hitting on twos with AP one. I get a crit and two hits. All right, I'm rolling two dice only because of AP1, and I'm saving on fives. Ooh, this was an interesting spot. You know, with the blooded, a lot of the ploys are not very good, and so I'm gonna have a lot of CP to burn. I know it's a low chance, but if I re-roll the one miss, I have a one in three chance to actually let this unit survive, which could be huge. So I'm gonna go for it. Come on, come on. Oh! Okay, that that was really good. I'm uh, I'm feeling much better after that. That helps me a lot. All right, next up, I get a bunch of activations in a row because Vic's all done, and uh, I just move up a bunch of guys and reposition them, avoiding Overwatch. I elected not to use my track target attack on the plasma gunner and continue holding the defensive objective four. Might be a bad decision, but I really can't afford a grenade in my face if Brad wins initiative. So next, my Butcher advances a little bit, and of course, Victor uses Track Target. That Butcher terrifies me. Looking for threes here. Oh, 
Oh my god, that's actually like maybe the game. That might be the game. Oh, for <laughs> sake. Not that it matters. And what a terrible roll. Not only did I need to get rid of that butcher, but between the flenzer and the butcher staying alive, the butcher not being injured, I am getting completely overrun on this side of the board. It's a game with dice, and dice be dice. Dice do be dice. Dice really do be dice. Also, grenadiers beat grenadiers, and I'm gonna <laughs> use my grenadier now. I've saved him for the very end because, you know, I want to grab objective four and deny Vic the chance to overwatch. So yeah, I'm just gonna go up, tap objective number four, and I'm positioned to maybe get a good crack on Victor's marksman if I win initiative. Man, I've definitely lost some games due to unlucky rolls, and I'm not saying Vic's out of it yet, but if he does lose, we can pretty much point to the Flenser surviving and the Butcher surviving, because that's pretty nutty. And the big stupid Ogren misplay. It does kind of balance out though, because I lost my trench sweeper to an unlucky roll in turn one, so I guess you win some, you lose some. Vic lost more than me though. <laughs> yeah, this turning point started out feeling pretty good and ended up feeling very, very bad. So we'll see what happens in turning point three. Maybe I'll only roll sixes for the rest of the game. Yeah, that that's probably seems like that's what's gonna happen. 100% chance, all sixes. Yeah. Okay, this initiative roll means nothing. It completely doesn't matter. It's just basically a formality. <laughs> nah, just kidding. It means a lot, and I won. So uh, first strategic phase, I got another blooded token to put out, and I'm gonna put it on my plasma boomer. I'm so excited, I can't even speak. Victor, what did you do? Uh, I waffled a lot between if I wanted to omni scramble your butcher or your grenadier. Either way, you're probably gonna one shot me with one of those two units, but decided on the butcher because in the off chance I survive your first attack, at least if it's coming from the Grenadier, I can still attack next instead of having to fall back first. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, I'm gonna spend one CP on uh, putting Glory Kill on your Marksman, and then I'm also gonna reveal Faction Tack Op 2, which means I need to control at least half in this mission, only two of the objectives. Not activate them, just control them, so I have to have guys on them more AP than Vic, and they have to be controlled in part by guys with blooded tokens. So I think on this mission is actually not too hard for me, and it's gonna help me get pushed over the edge, potentially. First up, I gotta use the Grenadier. I can activate objective number four before Victor has any chance to try and steal it, so that's pretty much a must do. And because of my big brain positioning in turning point number two, I can still get an attack in in the same activation. I'm attacking Vic's marksman here with a crack grenade. I auto retain one normal hit because of my blooded token, and the rest of the dice are hitting on threes with AP1. In total, I get one crit and three hits. Well, luckily I saved two of those, so only nine wounds go through. I can't believe I'm saying only nine wounds go through, but I stayed alive. All right, now my marksman runs away, hides behind the saboteur, and pops track target. I decided not to shoot at the grenadier because he's already activated, so he's not an immediate threat, and this way I can try to stop someone from getting further towards me. All right, next up, maybe a bit of a controversial play, but I'm gonna use my thug to move up and provide cover to my butcher, who's still in conceal. Now obviously from some positions, especially if Vic moves up to the vantage point from the big building, it's not really going to do much, but in some situations it could be helpful, and in addition, it helps the thug get in a position where he can maybe get to objective number three in the final turning point. Alright, that was actually a really great move, because I was hoping to keep my veteran on ground level, and so now I need to move my sergeant up to shoot the thug to try to get him out of the way. All I needed was twos, and I couldn't get it done. Next, my grenade launcher is just gonna tap objective one. I just need points. I pop up onto the vantage point. With lethal five in balance, I'm hitting on threes. Two crits and two hits landed. One auto save for cover and one roll to save. Only seven wounds go through, and that is another member of the one HP gang. Next, I move my corpseman up next to my plasma gunner, and I inject him with a stim. This time, I'm gonna give him the effect that is affectionately known by many in the community as a six up, feel no pain. Well, my original plan for Vantage was to get one point on this big terrain piece in my drop zone, and then another one on the tower, which is clearly not gonna happen now. So my saboteur moves up onto the point and does the Vantage action for another VP. 
Now my enforcer is just going to move and dash and try and get in a position where he can maybe help snipe objective number three next turn. Now I use comms array to make my saboteur shoot the enforcer. After a pretty good roll, only four wounds go through and he's down to two HP. Then my commsman moves up next to beside the saboteur and joins him trying to bring down the enforcer. A crit and a hit, only two normal saves so the enforcer's dead. RIP. Alright now, my butcher's gonna charge the marksman and fight. All he needs is one hit, and he gets it. The marksman is dead, and now a few things happen. First, I gain two blooded tokens to my pool. One for getting the kill, and one from a special ability that my butcher has. Secondly, for getting a kill in melee, my butcher heals for d3 wounds. And I'm also going to reveal Rob and Ransack and get a point for that. Yeah, that's a huge blow, but wasn't entirely unexpected. I tried to move far enough away, but just couldn't get that far with my marksman's compromised movement. At this point, my Helix Adept moves onto the vantage point to shoot the thug. My paths to victory here are getting very, very narrow, and I absolutely need to get objective 3 in the next turning point if I'm going to have any chance at all. Unfortunately, I roll 2 crits and a hit, the thug saves 2, and is down to 3 HP. Alright, well I'm feeling pretty good, but right now I'm just going to pass with my Flenser. That's absolutely insulting. So now my commsman has overwatch on the butcher. I roll two crits and a hit, bring him down. Unfortunately, that gives Brad another blooded token to spend. All right, well, I think I'm getting to the point here where I mathematically just win, but one thing that still scares me is the potential that Vic has marked target as one of his tack ops. To score with this, he needs to get shots onto my leader, and I just want to deny him the opportunity, so I hide my leader. My Helix Adept does an overwatch to try to bring down the thug again. Roll two crits, not bad. Brad <laughs> rolls another outstanding defense save. He re-rolls the last die and it saves both. So as my final activation of the turning point, I'll activate my Plasma Gunner and shoot, obviously overcharged, at Vic's Helix Adept. Because this guy has a blooded token, I auto retain one normal save. I'm hitting on fours, and I roll two crits. I miss with one die, and with my last CP, I try to re-roll it to confirm the kill. It's a whiff again, but it doesn't end up mattering. Vic doesn't save enough, and he's dead. So mathematically, my only chance here to win, or at least tie, would be if I score objectives two and three in the next turning point, and I'm able to get my Helix Adept onto the big OP piece of terrain and play Vantage. Obviously, he's just been vaporized by a plasma gunner, and so that's not going to happen, and it looks like I'm going to resign. My first kill team win on the channel. Finally. I thought that was a pretty fun game. It started out pretty well for me, I thought, and then the momentum just switched and I just lost. I'm not going to say that I played perfectly and that the dice are 100% responsible for me losing, but imagine how different that game would have felt if the Flenser and the Butcher died at the end of Turning Point 2. In hindsight, there's definitely some threats I could have ignored and some opportunities I could have taken, but just the way it goes. Also, Brad played a good game and beat me. I didn't just beat myself and lose. <laughs> this is a two-player game. Thanks. <laughs> you know what's crazy, Vic? I have a horde team, and I made three attack rolls that entire game. It all came down to positioning for me and just, like, trying to get in there and steal points from you. Three attack rolls and two space marines dead. That's brutal. Yeah, I think uh, the dice were my favorite today. I think I was in your favorite today, too. But since I predicted that I would lose, this is pretty much a victory for me. Yeah, I mean, you could say that. Anyway, peace, y'all. Peace, y'all.